Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar, Control Chart and Capability Analysis 101, sponsored by PQ Systems. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief for Quality Digest and your host for today's webinar. Today's webinar is designed to provide a brief overview of control charts, capability analysis, the relationship between the two, and tips for effective use of both. And the objective here is to help you better understand processes through the lens of a control chart and learn how to control and improve those processes. And then once the processes are in control, provide you with the ability to communicate the results to internal and external stakeholders. So during this webinar, we're going to discuss the prerequisites for capability studies, tips for effective use of control charts, how to interpret some commonly used statistics, and some common mistakes and how to avoid them. Before I introduce today's presenter, just a reminder that at any time you can send questions to us using the Q&A box. You can find that Q&A box in the lower right corner of your screen, or if you see a pull down menu at the top of your screen, click that. You'll see a Q&A button and you can click to open up the Q&A box. Send your questions to us at any time, but we will answer your questions once the presentation is over. A recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the slides, will be available one day after the webinar, so keep your eye open for that email. All right, let's get started. Right to it, today's presenter is Matt Savage, Vice President of Product Development at PQ Systems. Okay, Matt, go ahead. Okay, Dirk, thank you, and thank you for attending the webinar. This webinar is really a short webinar giving you some tips, various tools that you can use to help you out. I've got a couple goals, a few different goals in this webinar. The first thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of how can we make better use of our data. And, and we're going to talk about our data in terms of two flavors, this idea of central tendency, and we'll do that with a control chart where we're looking at say averages or how's the process running, is it trending up or downward or is it about where we want it to be. And then also through the eyes of not a McDonald's Big Mac, but the idea of variability. The reason I have this slide up about a, a Big Mac and variability is Ray Kroc, he had a philosophy that he wanted to serve burgers, buns, fries, and beverages that tasted just the same in Alaska as they did in Alabama. So what Ray really did is he strived for uniform methods of preparation. And his theory was if you prepare the, in this case, the Big Mac the same way everywhere, the output, what you taste is going to be pretty similar ever, everywhere. That is, he really wanted to have a low variability in our system. And really, if you think about our manufacturing and healthcare and finance and, and government, lots of different environments, that's exactly what we want, consistency. And not just consistency, but consistency on target. So you have data, we have data, there's data surrounding us. We want to make better sense of that data. One common approach to make sense of that data is through this idea of a histogram and a distribution of your data, typically with a mean or average, uh, some statistics like standard deviation, and then maybe you'll also have some specifications like the, the process can't be above this much or can't be below this much, or maybe it can't be anywhere outside of this boundary, these upper and lower specifications. A large part of that or what goes into that is starting with a control chart. So the, the control chart, and you see one here, is designed to really help you better understand how that process is, is behaving. At the end of this webinar, you know, if you're a Six Sigma PhD in statistics, you're probably not going to get a great deal of value, but if you're fairly new to this, I want to leave you with a better way to communicate to others so that when they say things like my CPK is this, you don't just look at them with a, a blank stare. You have a better understanding of that. So there's one statistic I've already mentioned, CPK, and that's a part of the capability analysis. And really, if you are not used to or you've heard about capability analysis or CPK or that sort of thing, it's a simple statistic that's calculated. You can do it with a calculator. It's not too complex. Some prerequisites or requirements, I should say, for capability analysis, you have to have one or both specs. And then you need to have your data. And from your data, we're going to generate the average or mean of that data. 
uh, we're going to compare that to, say, a target value and also look at that data in relation to those specifications. So, for example, let's say you were, um, you were going to go get a, uh, a, a replacement of your car or maybe even work done on your car, and, and the auto shop said they could sell you some brakes um, on the left or on the right. And they would say both of those brakes are good. That is, they're both in spec. So when you step on the brakes, it's not too, too, uh, too jumpy. It's, it doesn't break too long. They're, they're all in spec. Well, which would you pick? I think everyone attending this webinar would pick the one on the right, assuming the cost was the same. Well, that's a lot of what capability is about. It's about trying to drive home the process average to the target value and reduce the variability. Some important concepts is on control charts, we have control limits. On histograms, we have specification limits. Where I think there's a lot of confusion is this idea of control limits or three sigma limits, and you often put three sigma limits on histograms. But remember, control limits are there to talk to you about the actual variation or often called the voice of the process. Specification limits, on the other hand, they're the allowable process variation, often called the, the voice of the customer. What you should remember is control limits and specification limits don't have a lot to do with each other. Okay, so I'm going to now talk about the four states of quality. And rather than just show you this one diagram and, and have a bunch of words, I like visuals better. So let's start with the first state of quality, this idea of in control and not capable. Now, this webinar is geared at those who are somewhat new or maybe need a refresher. So as you look at this control chart, the black dashed lines at the top and at the bottom, those are control limits. I've superimposed red specification lines on this control chart. I know a lot of statisticians would say never do that. But for the purpose of this analysis, we're going to look at this chart. And you can look and see that everything is within those control limits. There are no unusual patterns, nothing that seems odd or it's just regular what we would call common cause variation. On the other hand, we do have points that are out of spec. That is, we have some points above the upper spec line and some that are below the, the lower spec line. So this process is considered in control but not capable because we have out of spec product. The next state of of uh, Quality is this idea of out of control and not capable. This is kind of the, the worst of the worst, or maybe you might look at it as an opportunity. So we have runs of points above the mean, runs of points below the mean, points above the upper limit, maybe below the lower control limit. We also have points outside the spec limits. So this is not predictable, also known as out of control or not in control, and it's not capable not capable of holding specs or producing a product or service to the required specifications. The third state is this, what some people look at as, as not that desirable, but others would say, wait a minute, everything is in spec or it's capable. Well, I look at this as um, it is out of control. I've got points above the mean. Uh, I've got a run of points above the mean. I've got points outside the control limits. But yet everything is in spec. Now, you'll hear me talk later in the webinar that to talk about capability analysis, your process needs to be in control. So that's one of the, that's one of the prerequisites for capability analysis. But let's just say for this analysis that everything is in spec, yet it's out of control. And then there's this final state of equality. This is a state that we all want to get to which is a state of predictability or stable or in control. Any of those words you want to use are fine. And in spec or capable. So that's one definition. You can think of capability or capable as something that's in spec. But that's kind of vague. So we're going to change that definition a little bit as we go through this, this uh, webinar. Okay, now for control charts, we've talked about charts for uh, measurement data, but there are control charts for count data. When you're looking at defective or, or defects or non-conforming, non-conformities, 
there are four different types of charts, or I should say four common types of attributes or count data control charts. Two of those four are quite common. The p-chart, and that's a, if you're, again, new to this, uh, think of it as a chart of percents or percent of defective items. And then the u-chart, which is defects per so many units. Uh, many times in healthcare or hospital settings, they use U-charts when they look at defects such as um, patients who get infections. So they might say our infection rate is one per 100,000 or one per 1,000 patient days or two per 1,000 patients, something like that, per so many U for units. So there are different charts, um, types of charts for count or attribute data. Now the types of or common types of charts for measurement data are individuals, X-bar, and sometimes moving average. Again, think of those charts as the central tendency charts. And then for the variability charts, moving range, range, and sigma are the three most common types of variability charts. Again, think of the, the Big Mac as having low variability or high consistency. So we're going to spend a lot of this webinar talking about measurement data control charts. Now control charts or process control, it's really used for a few different things. What I like to think of control charts for is to help me better understand what's happening in my process, in my system. Do I have any trends? Is it stable or not? Um, can I use this process that I currently have to predict what's going to happen next. And these control charts can be used all over the board, whether it be in finance, in manufacturing, in healthcare, in education. They can be used everywhere. So control charts are used for a variety of purposes. Capability analysis, it has its own advantages as well. And it's really more of a customer supplier agreement. It's a lot like or akin to a, uh, a report card that kids will be coming out from school pretty soon this school year's ending, um, and they will have grades. Those grades are there to rep represent or to tell the parents or the caregivers, how did these children do in school? Are they an A student or a C student or something else? Well, capability analysis is a lot like that same system. It's designed to communicate something about the process. So the customers, um, they may have a capability requirement such as I need a PPK value of at least 1.66 or some number like that. You might think of that, that as saying I need this process, this uh, let's say it's a piece of paper or a slab of steel or whatever it is. I need the thickness of that to be a certain value within this range and that range is my specifications and I want the PPK value to be a certain number or above. So capability analysis is really there to help with this customer supplier agreement that you're going to agree to do this or have this process meet these specifications, but not just meet them, meet them to a certain capability level or grade, if you will. Okay, so this webinar is about two things control charts, and capability analysis. It's designed for uh, an introductory look. So I'm going to go over this kind of a what is it, what does it look like, when is it used, how is it made model. So what is it? It's really a chart that looks at data and tries to show you trends and shifts. Um, you're looking at, at both central tendency, that is the X or X bar chart or moving average chart, and the variability chart. Remember, that's the range, the sigma, the moving range chart. What does it look like? Here is an example of what one looks like. In this case, it's an X bar and range. I know it's X bar because if you look at the top of the chart, there are five measurements taken, let's say, every hour. So every hour they take five new measurements and they plot the average of those five. Here is an individuals and moving range, also called an XMR chart, where the top chart just has one measurement every something. It could be every 
hour, or it could be every day, or in this example, it's um, uh, sales data taken weekly. So it's one measurement per week. So that's what it might look like. When is it used? When do you use an X bar and range or XMR chart? The main thing I want you to remember with control charts, all control charts, is that you've got to have the time order of the data preserved. That is, you can't go out and just collect a bunch of numbers, kind of put them in a, in a hat and pull the numbers out and, and draw a chart for that, that data. You can draw the chart, but it won't be very meaningful. So you want to have oldest to newest in that. So how's it made? You get data, usually 25 or more data points. You want to make any notes about the data that was collected. In this short webinar, we're not going to go through all eight steps, nine steps, I'm sorry, to go over how it's made. But I do want to pause on one of these steps, which is how to interpret the chart. Now, when thinking about this webinar, I really should have put a tenth step, because these nine steps are not value added. The tenth step, that is where you react to the information you learned on step nine, that's where the, the money comes in. That is, that's where the real value comes in. All of these nine steps are just overhead, they're waste, they're just work. But the improvement you get by taking action, that's the real value. In terms of interpreting charts, there are many different rules. I'm going to go through a few of these rules, again, more visually than words on paper. Okay, so here's one example. If you have a single point or more outside the control limit, in this case we have one data point or one sample above the upper control limit, you would consider this to be out of control. We have an anomaly, a special cause, something. Really, this chart is just telling you and I something different may have happened about that point number 10 in our process. Go see what may have happened. It doesn't mean you always find it, but it seems like something statistically is different about that point. Another rule, now some organizations might use a rule of six or eight or nine. Um, I'm just using a, an example with seven consecutive points below the mean to represent out of control or not stable. So it could be seven consecutive points below the mean, seven above the mean, or some other number. Here we see an example of seven consecutive points that are decreasing. Again, it could be increasing, it could be six, it could be nine. Whatever your organization kind of as ascribes to, that's what I want you to think about. Now this last one, this is a little bit more difficult. Most people would look at this and, and see this chart as being in a state of statistical control. That is, it looks like just plain old normal variation. And it took me a while when I looked at this, I thought, yeah, it does look like that, but something looks odd. Well, here's what's odd about this chart, is although the process is just going, bopping along, it's just behaving what I would call in a random fashion, my control limits are too wide. Now, these control limits may have come from the past, or it could be I'm, I'm looking at, say, an X-bar data with a sample size of, let's say, five or some other sample size. And the variability within those five measurements is quite big, causing these control limits to be quite large. So in this case, this is a case where uh, some of those rules where you talk about four points out of five within so many standard deviations or two points out of three within so many standard deviations, when you look at a chart like this, what you want to see is about a third of your data in the middle, about 95% of your data in the middle two-thirds, and in most cases about almost 100% of your data between the upper and lower control limit. And in this case, we're seeing about all of the data in the middle third, and that's why I would consider this, mm, you might call it too good to be true. Uh, a number of years ago, I was at a plywood manufacturing facility and I was given data, it was handwritten data on a piece of paper and they were putting it into our software and I was the instructor so I was given the piece of paper, I was reading off the data 
And I got to about the eighth data point, and the quality manager stopped me, and he said, no, that, that data is not right. And I looked, and I said, no, oh, yeah, it's right. This is, these are the numbers I'm reading off. And he said, no, no, that data is made up. And I didn't know, but he knew as a, as a process expert, he knew that data was not legitimate. He called it pencil whipping because they were just making up the data or too good to be true. So you, if you have something like this, it, if it is real, you might want to consider, probably should consider, recomputing those control elements. Okay, so that's the, a quick look at um, interpreting your chart. So earlier I mentioned you need to have some data and how much data do you need? Well, I said 25 or more points, but you can get by with a lot less. Donald Wheeler, who writes a lot for Quality Digest, he wrote once that you can get by with as few as four original values. I think what his real point was is if you don't have 25 data points, let's say you're collecting data monthly, and you don't want to wait 25 months before you look at a control chart, make a chart. And if something looks odd or out of control, investigate it, even with a small amount of data. What I want you to think about is, is this. When you look at a control chart, you're looking at that control chart to see for clues. Or do you, does it present any clues to you? Do you see anything in there that looks odd? Now, don't try to overanalyze the chart. If it looks in control, it might be, and it probably is, and move on. But if you do see clues out of control points, see what's going on. Take action upon that. So you're going to move from this idea of an out-of-control process over here in the lower left to at the top right, a more predictable system where everything is in control and predictable. I can predict the next shape of that histogram the next hour, what it's going to look like. So I mentioned before that one of the prerequisites before you get to capability analysis is a process in control. So once you get there, then we can talk about capability analysis. Now, in terms of capability analysis, there are a few different indices out there, CR, CP, CPK, CPU, et cetera, ones that begin with the letter P, and then this kind of hybrid one, CPM. There are a lot of different indices out there. I'm not going to go through each of these in terms of formulas and, and what all they mean. I don't think that's value added to you anyway. However, I do want to stop here and talk about the standard deviation. There are three standard deviations I'm going to talk about today. This one at the top, called, often called an estimated sigma, it's the one used for control charts. The one at the bottom, if you ever put data into Excel and, and ask Excel for the standard deviation, that STDEV function, it's that formula on the bottom. That's the one that will get used when you calculate any of these indices that begin with the letter P. Okay, so let's dive into just one of these indices, CP. It's simply the difference between your specifications and your process variability. Again, the voice of the customer divided by the voice of the process, or upper spec minus lower spec over six times the standard deviation. So it's a simple formula, but a formula like that, it's helpful, but let's add some more value to it. Let's say you have a, a process where you're required to have a CP of 1.0 or higher and a CPK of 1.0 or higher. So what does that mean? Well, a CP of 1 means your, your allowable spread is equal to the actual spread. Some years ago, and you may have heard the same analogy, I got the analogy of a parking space. Think of the white lines in a parking space as your specifications or your allowable spread. You're going to take your car and pull it into that spot, and if it just fits, just barely, that would be a CPK of 1. Now, what happens if your car is much narrower, and hopefully all the parking spaces you go in, the, the car is or vehicle is smaller than or narrower than the allowable width. In that case, your CP is greater than one, which says you have the potential 
to pull that car into the parking spot and have it fit. So CP greater than one is what you what really you want to strive for. Now here the CP is still greater than one because the vehicle can still fit in that parking space, but they didn't actually do it. So that's why you need another index called CPK, where it says not just can it fit, what is the potential to be capable, but how capable are we? And then of course, if your CP is less than one, your vehicle is just too big for that parking space. Or think of it as your um, process or product data shows more variation than what's allowed. If you have a case like that, you have got only two things you can do about it. So again, if your CP is less than, your actual CP value is less than what it's required to be, you can only widen the specs. That's usually difficult to do. Most engineers and most, uh, most of your customers don't want you to change or widen the specs. So you're really left with one key thing to improve that process, and that's reduce the variation. Now, sitting here in this webinar for next half hour or so, reducing variation, that's easy to talk about, but it's hard to do. It's a lot of work. And your primary uh, tool to help you reduce variation, well, that's the control chart we were talking about before. So again, if you're indices are not where they want to be, reducing variation is, is the big ticket item. That's what you want to focus in on. So that's just all about CP. Let's talk about some other indices. Here's one called CPU and CPL. and CPK is just a smaller of those two indices. So there's lots of different formulas out there and some math, but we're going to talk a little bit in a moment about how, what does that mean in terms of if I get a CPK value of, say, 0.7 or 0.5 or 2.0? So for um, some key assumptions, when you get to capability analysis, you've got to have a control chart. That control chart is in a state of statistical control. In layman's terms, I just like to say my process is stable. I can predict what's going to happen next based on the past X number of data points. Obviously, for capability analysis, I started with this. You need to have one or both specifications. And this last requirement, the distribution of the data is bell-shaped. You can do capability analysis with data that is not bell-shaped. It's slightly different. We don't have time for that in this short webinar, but it can be done. So don't worry about it if you expect your data to not follow a bell-shaped distribution. Okay, so the what is it? What does it look like? How is it made? Well, there are different steps to calculate the CP, CPK, CR, all the indices that begin with the letter P. Somewhere along the way, you'll encounter these things called Z values. And I remember the first time I, someone told me about Z values, I just, I looked at the math and I, I, I mean, the math isn't hard, but it never made sense to me. What does that Z value actually mean? So we're going to help you with that. Okay, so let's say you've got uh, data we've collected. I'm not going to show you all the data, but from that data, the average of my data is 10.0, so that's my X double bar. My subgroup size is 5. My average range is 5.81, and I've got some upper and lower specs. All right, so that's what my spec spread looks like in my mean of the data. So right away, you know one thing, that I could make improvements to this process if I could move my mean so it's midway or exactly in the midpoint of the upper and lower spec. Looks like I could move it to the right just a little bit. Well, the next thing we want to do is calculate this standard deviation. Okay, so if your eyes are glazing over now, I'm going to make this simple. It's a simple formula, the average range over D2. D2, 
I don't know what a D2 value is. I always look it up. It's in the back of a stats book. So you look up a D2 value, and in this case, for a subgroup size of 5, it's 2.326. So in this example, our estimated sigma, it's about 2.5. Well, if we multiply that by 3 to get three standard deviations, and you add and subtract that from the mean, you get 2.5 to 17.5. Okay, what I like is more pictures. So as I look at this, this is what the distribution of that would look like. And right away, you know things are not good. And, and you know things are not good because your specifications are inside of the plus and minus 3 sigma. So you want to have your specifications outside of that. So given you can't move your specs, you have to move your process. That is, imagine it was a parking space at your work, and you've got a large vehicle that will never fit. Well, it's pretty hard. You either have to repaint the parking space or get a smaller vehicle. Well, in, in our environment, what we have to do is reduce our variability. That is, that bell-shaped curve on here, you've got to shrink it down. But given this data set that we've got, we now want to figure out, okay, how bad is it? What is our letter grade in this? Well, one step to figuring, figuring out how good or how bad it is is to look at that area in the tail that is above the upper spec. There's a small gray um, shading and below the lower spec, there's a little bit larger gray shading. I want to figure out how much data do we expect to be in that gray area. The way I do that is by calculating z values. Again, the math isn't hard, it's just a subtraction and a division. So z upper is 2.32, z lower is 1.71. If someone asked me, what does a Z upper of 2.32 mean? I would say, no idea. However, if I take that, that number, that 2.32, and I go over to a standard normal, also called a Z table, if I go to that table and I go to the 2.3, and then to the x point x2, or the 2.32, or those two intersect, I get this number, 0 0.0102. And I'm thinking, okay, what does that z value of 2.32 mean? Well, it corresponds to 1.02. Remember, our other z value was 1.71. It happens to correspond to 4.36. Okay, so the area, that gray shaded area above the upper, the Z upper side, I'm telling, or this is telling me that a little bit over 1% of my data is going to be above the upper spec. And a little bit more than 4% of my data is expected to be below the lower spec. So the Z values are there to help give you a clue how much data you expect to be out of spec. I don't know if there's any other useful um, purpose for a Z value. It's a lot of work to get some good information, but it's, it's helpful. And, and actually, if I, if I can jump in real quick, Matt. Um, I just want to remind people, and questions are coming in, but if you have questions for Matt, on anything uh, that he's talked about so far or that he will talk about, uh, just send those questions using the, the, the Q&A uh, box in the lower right corner of your screen there. Um, but Matt, I got a quick question on this because I was starting to get confused until you said something that kind of uh, made my mind go a little bit here. So if you had a chart like this and you're going to say, okay, well, doing these calculations, I can see that I can expect that maybe a little over 5% of my data is going to be outside specification limits, you could use that to decide whether or not it's, what, cost effective to maybe, you could say, you know what, I can live with 5% of my whatever's uh, being out of spec because there's such a low cost, low cost item 
that it's it's it would cost me more to bring those 100% within spec than it would for me to improve the process to uh, you know it would cost me more to improve the process than it is to lose 5% of my my uh, uh, my product i mean is, would that be one way to maybe use this data well yeah in in a quick clarification so i'm saying a little bit more than 5% of my data is expected to be out of spec. It yeah. may be that I had nothing out of spec because I'm sampling from a population and the items I sampled weren't out of spec, but I'm expecting about 5 point, uh, what, 3.8% to be out of spec. And then once you have that, you then make the decision, is it cost effective to keep running where we are? And some people say, you know what, we, for, for the time being, we have to keep running where we are Maybe we have to do sorting of the product afterward. And again, that's not value-added activity. Right. Yeah, so right now, this is just plain old math, and it, it's up to, to you all looking at your processes, what decisions to make. It might be okay. that you say, you know what? It would cost us a lot more to improve the process. We can't continue on with this, and you're going to do something else. Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, so let's see. How's capability analysis performed? Well, we've talked about the CP. Remember the, the, the parking spaces and the car width? It's, just, again, a simple calculation. It's some um, subtraction, some multiplication, and division. Here's where you want to stop. You will or someone has a requirement of something. Like, as a parent, we have a requirement of our son or daughter to get an A or a B or a, some grade, some letter grade or some amount of attendance. So there's some requirement out there. Let's assume for the moment that your requirement is a CPK of 1.0 or better. I recognize that most industries are required to have a 1.33 or 1.66 or 2.0, but let's say your requirement is a 1.0 or better. That's for CPK. Well, CP can never be larger than CPK. So we know right away you're not meeting that requirement. So think of it as a failing grade, if you will. So CPK, if we were to calculate that, I showed you one formula er earlier. Another formula is simply the smallest Z value divided by three Remember that Z upper and Z lower, that well, the smallest of, the, of those two is 1.71. So our CPK is 0 0.57. So what does that mean, 0 0.57? That's pretty hard to know what that means because it's a unitless number. But if your requirement is a 1.0 or better, then you're failing. If it was a 1.57, then you're a lot happier because you're more capable. Your, your, um, your process variability is much tighter than what's required. Okay, I mentioned before about this other index called CPM that's kind of in between all of those, and here's our third type of standard deviation, the sigma sub CPM. What I like about this statistic is it gets you to focus in on the target value of your process. Again, I'm going to use some pictures. If your process average, the X double bar or X bar, is right where you want it to be, that is right on target, you're happy, right? Well, that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is how much variability do we have? And again, if your CP is re requirement is 1.0 or above, in, in this picture, this example, this is not very good. Our CP stinks, so does CPK, and so does CPM. Now, if our, again, our CP requirement is 1.0 or above, which probably means CPK is 1.0 or above, CP is great. This process variability is half of, of the allowable variability, that is the specification spread, but I'm way off target, and that's why my CPK is not so good. I'm way off to the left, and that's also in what, where the CPM is, uh, it's not failing us. It's telling you that this process is kind of failing the expectation. 
So what I like about the CPM statistic is it tries to get you and I to drive the process average right at the target value. CPM is a very good statistic to use once you get your CP and CPK numbers higher than you need them to be or, or at least equal to what you need them to be because then you'll focus a little bit more on how are we in relation to the target value. So earlier in this webinar, I mentioned these other indices that begin with the letter P, and I haven't covered any of those, and we're almost out of time. Well, all those other indices that begin with the letter P, they follow the same logic as CP, CR, CPU, CPL, CPK, except they use the other standard deviation, the one that you would typically get from Excel. Now, if you're using software like, like our SQC pack, it'll do both for you. Most software will do both for you. If you're doing it all in Excel, you have to calculate two different standard deviations to get a CPK as well as a PPK statistic. Okay, the last example of CP, CPK, and CPM, this is, again, what I talked about where you want to be. Now, again, your customer may be requiring even more capable than this, that is, tighter and tighter distribution compared to the allowable distribution. And in that case, you've got to go back to your control charts and look for those special causes, those anomalies. And if you don't have any of those, then you have to go back and, and do things differently. If you don't do things differently and your process is in control, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. So you've got to make some changes. Perhaps it's different raw materials, different line speed, different temperature, different, oh, any number of things. So some final thoughts. Control charts are really designed, are really there to talk about stability and predictability. Capability can be used to compare different processes, and it really ties in this idea of the plus or minus three standard deviations compared to the specification limits along with the mean and tries to get you to focus in on, I'll say that the bigger picture, now that the part or process or system is, is done, how did we do? Again, a lot like letter grades in, in the school system, not what's going on at the moment, but how did we do in the past? What we're gonna do in the future, the control chart's gonna help tell you that. If your process is predictable, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting unless the system changes. Okay, so we've gone through just about 40-some minutes. I want to leave you with a couple thoughts about our company. We've got a couple uh, software products, SQC Pack for statistical process control and Gauge Pack for gauge management software. If you want to know more about those, go to pqsystems.com. Uh, Dirk has got some questions, he said. Um, I'll also leave my email address and phone number should you want to contact me directly. But Dirk, I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks. And uh, before we get to the questions, uh, now is the time for uh, those of you who haven't submitted them to start submitting them. Uh, you can use the Q&A box. Uh, you should find that in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Or you might have to go to the top of your screen, look for a drop-down menu, a pull-down menu if you mouse up to the top. And uh, you might see a Q&A button there that you can, uh, you can click and open up the Q&A box. Okay. Um, somebody wanted to know is is it possible to predict if the data collected from a process – whoops, <laughs> my, my note just disappeared. Hold on one second. Yeah, is it possible to predict if the data collected from a process can allow you to predict how the process will evolve? So I'm assuming here we have a stable process. Uh, it's in control. Can you use that to predict what you might get from this in the future? Well, yeah, well, yes, um, and, and the key requirement there is if nothing else changes, and you know, things are always changing, but the, the idea, that's the whole idea, to make predictions about the future based on the past. So if in the past it's been in control or predictable, you can predict the future until something changes. And then when something changes, maybe you, you got a different um, operator and that operator, he or she operated the line differently, or you had different 
uh, patient types or maybe it's a cold and flu season or whatever your process or product is you're looking at, if something changes, then that's where the control chart is probably going to show you an out of control point or out of control condition allowing you to react. And again, out of control might be a good out of control. If you're using a control chart to look at, let's say, your uh, your personal weight and, and let's say you want to lose weight and you, you monitor that every single week and, and you see it trending downward, yeah, it's out of control, but it's a good out of control. Okay. Um, bringing up my... Um, oh, okay. Uh, do you have a recommendation for statistical analysis for batch processes and, uh, for instance, making paint? So batch processes. Well, for statistical analysis, um, I, I'm not going to directly answer this. I think Google has a great way to search. Um, there's lots of get different statistical analysis software like R, um, SPSS, SAS, uh, Minitab, things like that for statistical analysis. I, I don't have a great answer for you there. I would probably do a Google search and, and look at the different reviews. And, and a lot of times you can post some of your data and the questions you have, and, and lots of people in the community will, will help give you uh, some good answers for that. Okay. Well, I guess I, I guess the way I interpreted that is maybe um, can, watching watching your presentation, I was I was thinking individual points. Oh, right. Okay. But, but does it have to be individual points, or can it be the results of of a of a batch? I guess is what I'm assuming that's what he's asking. Oh, it it could be a a single point. Let's say you're looking at at pH, you know, in in a batch of paint, batch of beer, batch of anything. You, okay. you don't need to measure the pH multiple times because it's a homogeneous unit. So your subgroup size is one and you just are looking at a control chart batch to batch. In that case, SQC pack and an individual's moving range chart would be a great tool to use to see how we're doing. Okay. Um, this is, you know, we get this question a lot. This is, this is interesting. Um, how do you determine what to measure? You know, is it parts produced per hour? Is it defects per hour? Is it maintain a certain, you know, is it, is it weight? Um, uh, how, how do you determine what in your process you're going to collect all this data on and, and chart? Oh, that, that's a great question. It's a hard one for me to answer as a general answer, but my, um, my starting point is what is important to you? If, for example, Let's take something that we're all familiar with, which is our health. And you went to the doctor and your doctor said, you're not healthy. Well, what, what can you measure? And you might ask, well, what about me is not unhealthy? Is it the blood pressure? Is it my weight? Is it my, um, I don't know, all the different factors related to your health? And then you might decide of all the things related to your health, what are some key factors that you want to measure? So when you look at, let's say you're in manufacturing um, steel or wood or whatever it might be, you're probably the best expert or others in your field at what to measure. So it's hard for someone like, like me to go in and, and say, you ought to be measuring this. I'm not the expert in that. I can certainly help you with when you've got some measurements on some key quality characteristics, how to better understand those. But I don't have a great answer for what to measure. Yeah, it depends, it depends on what you need. It depends on your process, yeah. yeah. Um, can you explain the difference between CPK and PPK? Right, mathematically, it's one thing. The only difference between CPK and PPK is which standard deviation is used. So the CPK uses that one where we did the average range over D2, R bar over D2, and there's nothing wrong with that one. PPK, it came about largely because software and calculators became so prevalent that people could calculate that ST dev formula, the sigma of individuals, so easily. So they had to come up with another index, and they, it PPKs that other index. So mathematically, that's the only difference. Now, one thing I like about the two is 
if your process is in control, your CPK and PPK numbers are going to be somewhat similar. If your process is way out of control, your CPK may be great, but your PPK doesn't lie to you. It's going to tell you it stinks. So if you could only choose one statistic, I would go with PPK. Okay. That's uh, the 30-second uh, answer. Okay. Um, would you recommend using individual measurements or average of measurements to measure process capability? It depends on your process. Um, sometimes, uh, and I've dealt with customers who started off taking subgroup sizes of four or five or even larger, eight, and maybe have a 16 cavity mold. They, they take all 16 as a subgroup, a subgroup size of 16. If all of those measurements are so similar to each other, your variability is going to be really tight. Everything's going to be out of control. And things you're saying, I can't look at capability analysis. Everything is out of control. Well, in that case, if everything is all the same or similar to each other, you might decide that, look, instead of taking a subgroup size of 16 or 5 or 4, maybe we'll just do a subgroup size of 1. Or the example I gave before, would certain industries lend themselves to having a subgroup size of only one? In most hospital settings or healthcare settings or, or your finances at, at your company, you have one number, let's say a sales each day, sales each week, sales each month, net income each month or each quarter. It's only one number, so you can't really use a subgroup in, in that case. You, you've already gathered up the data to get a single number that you're going to use each time period. Okay. Um, is it wise to monitor OEE in a control chart, and what chart would you use? I need more information. Um, maybe after this webinar, I can, I can get more details on that. OK. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that's no problem. Uh, so actually, by the way, for those of you, um, it, uh, we may not get to all the questions, so or uh, as you just uh, as you just noticed, we may need more information on those questions. So I am going to be forwarding all of your questions, uh, even the ones we answered, on to Matt. And so uh, if there's something he wasn't able to answer or he needs more information, he'll be able to get back to you after the webinar. Um, next question. This one's a little complex, so let's try it. Is it statistically correct? to mix different populations with different spec limits and zero them to calculate capability based on their deviation to zero? Um, I don't know what that would tell you, which is, I guess, okay. my way of saying I don't believe it to be correct. If you've got different specifications, different items you're looking at, it, it almost sounds like you're going to take an apple and an orange, a banana, put it on the scale, and say, you, you know, yeah, you can get the average weight, and and if you knew the average price of of or the price of each of those, you could figure something out. Uh, I would treat them all differently because you've got different specs, so treat it as a different process. And you know, software is available today that that can look at whether you have five processes, five different sets of specs, or five thousand different sets of specs. It can help you help you with that really easily. Okay. Um, you may have uh, you may have mentioned this at the very beginning. Um, how would you tackle attribute data such as just pass fail? Oh yeah. So uh, the, without any knowing any more than that, if it's simply pass fail, that's probably it's defective or it's not. So that's going to be a P or an NP chart. And then which of those two do I decide to use? It depends on if you look at that, let's say, every shift, how many parts passed or how many failed. Uh, you, you could then say, okay, on average, we produce X parts a shift. And if that X is a constant number, you can do an NP chart. And even if you could do an NP chart, I love the P chart because any time I show a P chart to someone, they get it. That is, they understand, oh, this is a chart of percents or proportions of my data, the, the, the percent of parts that passed or the percent of patients that went out um, fully 
healthy or whatever it might be. The, the, the P chart is great in that case, whether it's pass fail. The C and U charts are more used when you're looking at, at defects, so non-conformities. Uh, if you're producing, I don't know, pick, let's say you, you, uh, you make a watch and it's got a blemish in the band, it's got a slight scratch, but overall you're still going to sell that watch. It might have defects to it. So there you might do a C chart or U chart. Um, I often do not uh, find a lot of value in C charts. So I often go to, e e even with, now this is kind of a, a diversion, but even though you've got count data, I will often take that and treat it as an individual's measurement data, just because I find it's more valuable. And th I guess that's, that's one of the, the parting thoughts is I want to leave you with is you, know, you can listen to webinars like this and you can read different things. Use whatever chart and tools that help you the most. If you find the C chart is not working for you and you look at it as an individual chart and it helps you improve, I'm a big proponent of using that. Okay. Um, you know, early, early on when you were talking about spec limits versus control limits, a thought occurred to me. So suppose that your, your, your spec limits are well outside your control limits, and you, you, do your, you run your, your control chart, and you see that your process is, I guess, out of control. You, 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 have, uh, you, you, have, you have special cause variation within your, uh, within your control chart, but you're still well within your spec limits. Do you... Is that just a point of interest, or do you do you actually care? If is you know you have an out of process, an out of control process, but you're still operating well within your specification limits. Um, okay, so I care, but is it cost justifiable to care much? Um, yeah, so okay. Let's imagine my subgroup size is one, and my spec limits are so wide in relation to my control limits, and I've got some out of control data. That's saying that part-to-part -part irregularities exist, but overall, I'm never going to be making anything bad. If your customer is willing to accept that, and, and they probably would be because they gave you the specification limits, then it may not make sense cost-wise to make further improvements to that. There, that is, always go with the low-hanging fruit, start with that first, because that's where you're going to get the, the biggest bang for the buck. And then once you make all these vast improvements where you're never out of spec or never even close to out of spec, um, now the, the pure quality improvement expert, they would say always focus in on making it better and better and better. And, and I agree you should, but it may not be cost justifiable to do that. Right. Okay. That's, that's kind of what I was thinking. Although I, I guess another just, just – and I'm just – brainstorming here is it could be indicative that there might be something going wrong with your process and it might be worth investigating just because you might have you, you know maybe you have a piece of equipment that's starting to go out and so you know it, it could be something catastrophic down the line and maybe if you don't look at it uh, but maybe once you've identified what the special cause is you decide eh, it's not worth spending the money on it but it might be worth investigation Oh, right, yeah. There was one of our customers looking at the torque of their motors, and and they were, once they got a statistical signal about the torque being out of control, they knew that it wasn't going to be long before that motor failed, so they could do a preventative maintenance, um, you know, and without scrapping a whole bunch of their in-process product. Right. Okay, yeah, that, that's kind of what made sense. Um, okay, well, you know, um, uh, I think we have a couple more questions here, but I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because we're at the top of the hour. Uh, don't worry, I will, if we didn't get to your question, I will forward your questions on to Matt so that he can, uh, and it'll have your email attached, so Matt can get back to you if we didn't get to your, uh, if we didn't get to your question. So Matt, thanks a lot for the presentation. A uh, lot of uh, solid information in there. I appreciate it. Sure thing. Thank you very much. And thanks to all of you as well for joining us. Uh, you will be receiving an email with a link to a recording of this webinar as well as a PDF of the slides within a day. So keep your eyes open for that 
uh, for that email. You should see it sometime tomorrow. Um, that it usually takes about 24 hours for us to get all this uh, data collected, and we'll send you an email, and you'll be able to watch that, uh, watch the recording, and uh, look at the slides as well. So, uh, and I'm going to go ahead. Uh, Matt has to go. I'm going to go ahead and keep the webinar open for a little bit. So, if you have extra questions you want to submit, go ahead and submit them, and I'll get them to uh, to Matt. Um, uh, later on today. So uh, Matt, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to all of us uh, from here at Quality Digest and PQ Systems. Everybody have a great day, and we will see you at the next webinar. So long.